Welcome to your commercial-free, uninterrupted investment show, sponsored by the SEC-registered investment firm, Wilsey Asset Management, a fiduciary firm owned and operated by President Brent Wilsey, who has been putting clients' investment needs first for over 40 years. The Smart Investing Show has been giving unbiased financial information for over 27 years on local radio stations right here in San Diego, providing you with fundamental analysis on stocks and investments you want to know about. Now, here are your hosts, Brent and Chase Wilsey. Well, good morning and welcome to the Swarm Investing Show. I'm Brent Wilsey. Just about 8.02 on Saturday morning. Great to have you here this Saturday morning and every Saturday morning. With me is Chase. Good morning, Chase. How are you doing? Hey, good morning. Doing well. we got a lot to uh, talk about here the next hour. We'll take the phone calls from people. Hey, write this number down, 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. Two eight eight zero nine seven three, and I just realized Jay's coming in, which kind of talk about me being old technology and so forth. <laughs> Write it down. Why would you not just put it in your phone? <laughs> <laughs> it's the old school. The old school, exactly. So, um, do I have a workshop coming up? Because we had a lot of people attend the last workshop. People really want to talk about this stuff because they are concerned about inflation, concerned about um, uh, the, the war in Ukraine. So this is a time that they really want to come in and kind of talk about what we're doing. So we decided to do another workshop uh, April 7th from 6 to 8 p.m. in Scripps Ranch. Uh, we're going to talk about what is true financial planning. And this is a very important time to have financial planning. If you're regular to the show, you know around 8.40, a Harrison Johnson, our CFP, comes in, talks about financial planning. We're going to talk about the individualized concentrated value portfolio, how to find good quality businesses at a good price, and why investing and strong equ equities can give you the best long-term long return if done properly. That is going to be, again, a Thursday, April 7th, 6 o'clock, but you got to sign up. Go to our website, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. Very easy to do it. You can click right there. You'll see workshop registration. Uh, by the way, I think we made our website pretty easy for people to get the important stuff. Workshop registration, podcast, how to contact us, but easy to do that on our website, I think. Yeah, and, and some people say, I don't I don't listen to podcasts. Well, we try to make it as simple as possible. <laughs> if you use the internet, go to Smart Investing 2000, you'll see a big button at the top that says, listen to our podcast. And, and that's just in case. I'm not saying don't listen to the show live, but if you're like, oh, I gotta, I gotta run, do an errand, and you miss part of the Smart yeah. Investing show, and be like, gosh, they were talking about something so interesting, because the Smart Investing show is full of interesting topics. You go to our website and you can always catch past episodes. Yeah, or if you just kind of slipped in that morning. Yeah. We'd like to have you live, but you know what? You can always catch it on later on. So let's get into some important things this past week. Well, let's talk about the economy because retail sales came out this past week with a headline miss as they grew 0.3% compared to January below the estimate of 0.4%. Now, a major positive report was January's revised upwards and compared to December, retail sales grew 4.9%. The initial January report shows a gain of just 3.8%. Uh, compared to February 2021, retail sales grew at a very strong rate of 17.6%. This, this does not account for inflation, uh, but even taking into consideration the recent CPI number of 7.9%, the year over growth is still positive. The three areas saw the biggest increases compared to last year were, no surprise here, gas stations 36.4%, Restaurants up 33%, and clothing stores, surprised me, up 30.6%. And looking at it, you said obviously gas stations. I mean, reason for that, rising energy prices. But restaurants and clothing stores, you have to remember, they're, they're likely still benefiting from the continued recovery from COVID as they were two sectors that were hit the hardest from the pandemic. Also, too, I think with clothing now, I, I keep hearing more and more people going back to the office. I see more and people mm -hmm. in our office building. And... You got to get new clothes to go back to work. If you've had jammies or pajamas, I don't know what I call them, jammies. <laughs> jammies. You have pajamas, you have pajamas for the last year. Well, now you got to change that out and get some new clothes. But while we are seeing some areas decelerate, there is still plenty of money in the economy to provide a good 2022. In fact, the recent release for M2 for January 2022 showed liquidity of $21.8 trillion in the economy. As a reminder, M2, that's like your checking accounts, your saving accounts, cash, also, two money market funds, really liquid type assets there. And I'm going to repeat that number again. $21.8 trillion of still liquid assets. That, that's a lot of money out there. Our forecast remains the same, that 2022 will be just fine. But questions of a small recession are starting to appear 
one thing about 2023. And I have had people say, oh, we're going to have a recession this year. I don't see how we'd have a recession this year with that 20, I'm going to round up, $22 trillion of cash in the economy because people are still spending money. Yes, I know gas prices are higher, yes. Uh, and what it surprised me too, by the way, kind of jumping off track a little bit, was usually when gas prices go up, people will stop spending less on restaurants. Well, that's not happening because there's so much money in the economy. And, and I, I want to say for the last year or longer, that M2, that liquid money number, it's been over $20 trillion. So there's yeah. money coming in. Yes, they're spending money, but they're still bringing in more than they're spending on that hole in the economy. Yeah, and I, I just think having that lockdown, having that liquidity, I, I think people are saying, oh gosh, the gas prices, yeah, they suck at, you know, <laughs> close to $6. I paid five ninety nine the other day. <laughs> That's <not>. terrible. <laughs> but, uh, well, actually five seventy nine with my 20 cent discount at uh, Chevron. Oh, there we But go. Uh, the thing is, I mean, people right now, they have the cash, they say, gosh, it sucks, but I don't care. I was locked up for a year and a half. I'm still going to go on a trip. I'm still going to go out to eat. I have the cash, so why not? That's why I think you'll still see a, a good remainder uh, of the year here. And we didn't do, I didn't do a post on it, but I did uh, read in the Wall Street Journal this past week that people still say, yes, even with the higher prices, they still want to go out and travel. They've been cooped up way too long. So, And I think you said you're staying at a hotel uh today mm -hmm. and kind of shocked on the price that they're charging, but yeah. they can get it because I think they're fully booked. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm very curious to see. We're going up to Palm Desert, so I'm interested to see how busy it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think I'm going to find it rather busy. Let us know next week. Uh, staying on the oil companies, uh, if you hold in your portfolio oil companies like BP, Shell, or Exxon, you may want to be prepared for write downs of assets against earnings in the next quarter or two if the Ukraine-Russia war does not change course soon. Yeah, it's estimated here that about $20 billion of assets in Russia, which because of the pullout, have now become worthless. This could hurt the earnings of these companies, perhaps causing a pullback in their stock price. I'm also going to say it could be a double whammy, where right now we had a huge spike in energy prices. If things do cool off, energy prices do recede somewhat. Now you're going to get the climb there. That's going to be negative. And also, too, you get these write-downs. That's going to be negative as well. So I, I'd say... The energy sector is more of kind of a hold for us right now. I, I'm not licking my chops in terms of looking at energy companies. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think now people say, oh, I'm going to get an energy. Well, you kind of missed the boat. You should have gotten an energy back before and was struggling. And that's what we always talk about. That's what we talk about the workshop and stuff is try to buy companies on sale, not when everybody knows they're a great buy. By the way, um, I was also reading this past week that the futures, and I don't follow the futures on oil, but I saw this pop up. The futures, which predicts the future cost of oil, for, for December this year, it was $88 a, a barrel. So that means they're not looking for these high amounts. They're looking at for it to come back down again. Yeah. So, we'll, I mean, we'll see. I mean, things can change, obviously. The direction of the war could change or something else. But uh, I, as far as investing in energy now, I, I think no miss the boat. And you could see these write downs we're talking about uh, because I have heard other businesses in Russia saying, we feel when we leave Russia, that building, that business we had, is gone. Yeah. We'll never get it back. And that, that causes a write down because it's an asset which is now worthless. Yep. So, yeah, be, be careful. You got to understand the accounting behind the decisions. And I mean, I, we do have companies in Russia that, yeah. that operate there, but we understand the impact of it. What, what's the percentage of sales that came from Russia? What's the percentage of the manufacturing that came from Russia? You, that's the type of things you want to look at. And also, too, what, what's still the value of that business? Earnings are probably going to be right. hit, but then what are you still paying for those earnings? That's kind of an analysis. You don't just want to say, oh, my company was in Russia. I, I'm, I'm going to sell out. Well, you, you want to look at the impact and, and what the, the value of that is going to be to your portfolio. Right. And, and, and because we do manage money, we got to talk to the vice president of, of the company. Uh, also, too, he did bring up a good point, too, is that all the manufacturing they're doing in Russia, that stays in Russia. Because we were concerned, like, what if they're manufacturing in Russia for, like, Europe or something, they can't get it out, but that's not the case. So these are important things. We always talk about do your research, kind of sharing with you, this is the research that we did was like, okay, we know we've, you've got operations in Russia. What is the effect? Is it going outside of Russia? Is it really hurting the company? And he said at this point, it's it's not material. Yep. So important things doing that research. Let's also too, talk about uh, inflation and consumers. Uh, many consumers are being made uh, many comparisons are being made to the com to the 1970s with the current st situation of inflation and rising gas prices. One big difference today versus then is that in the 70s, food and energy costs consumed about 20 percent 
of consumers' budgets. And and you look at that today, it's half that, or approximately 10%. Also, we talk about consumer balance sheets. They're stronger than they were back in the 70s. So why we feel the increase in prices is not as harmful as it was back in the 70s. We can feel it. There's no doubt oh, about yeah. it. You notice the gas prices going up, but as you kind of talked about already, it's not detrimental at this point. And I always talk about people having their personal inflation. I had somebody comment with, uh, uh, on Facebook, and said, yeah, but my, my drug prices are going way up. Well, I don't take any drug. I, I think I take one drug or something, something for my blood pressure or something. But it, you know, it's not major. Now, if you're older and you take five, six, maybe seven different drugs, you don't have a good health care plan, then it would affect you. But if you're 25 or 30, you're not taking drugs, well, your inflation's okay because it's, it's not affected by the drugs. So mm-hmm. that's what you have to look at. I think there's a basket, I wanna say about 200 different uh, items in the in- inflation index. Yeah, and the other thing you look at too is uh, you know, older people that may be on more drugs, let's say they're driving a lot less, so the gas shouldn't be hitting them as hard because they're not out there moving around, they're probably not traveling, which is also seeing inflation with airline tickets going yeah. way, way up. So. As you said, yeah, inflation is going to impact different people in different ways, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's something you have to deal with and, and how to reduce your inflation. Um, um, there's different things you can do, but there's other things. Again, we talk about all that money in the economy. I, I, I think a lot of people, are like, they don't like it, but it's like, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Eventually, it will be a problem if it stays up, but right now we're dealing with it. The other thing I was going to say real quick on energy is you look at the efficiency of cars, back f- comparing the 70s to today, right. and put this in in our post, but I was just thinking about it, is I mean, I even look at my, my Chevy Silverado. I get right. you know close to 20, and it is a V6, but I know you have like a 2002 Chevy Silverado. Oh, oh yeah, the, 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 my pickup truck, yeah, 2002. Yeah, 2002, yeah. that gets like, I used to drive it in high school, I think that gets like 10, 10, <laughs> 10 miles per gallon. <laughs> so while gas prices have climbed, you can still, you know, get better miles per gallon so you're not paying necessarily as much especially again you compare the 1970s gosh the fuel efficiency (laughs) has gotten so much better so it's not as impactful as it was you know back then and and actually when when we rate these posts and these things uh, we we don't cover everything but you're right that was in the the item that I read that they did mention that that because back in the 70s it was a bigger amount because vehicles were getting such low miles per gallon and now they i mean my escalade which is uh, 470 horsepower it's huge i think it weighs six thousand pounds that gets about 16 miles a gallon average yeah on, on the freeway i think it gets close to 20 and around town probably about 14 but yeah I, and i have it there all the time i think right now it's average 6.1 for for a six thousand pound vehicle with 470 horsepower that thing gets up and goes pretty good so uh, a lot more efficient a lot more efficient exactly all righty phone number is 833-288 Zero nine seven three. That's eight three three two eight eight zero nine seven three. Let's go up to Oceanside and speak with Joe. Joe, you're on the Smart Invest Show. Brent Chase, how can we help you? Good morning, boys. Hey, how you doing? Um, I'm great. You cut me off last week, so I imagine I get twice the time. <laughs> yeah, we'll, um, we'll, we'll give you two minutes today. <laughs> yeah, I was, <laughs> hey, um, yeah. And if you are slow, I'd like to do another stock as well. But um, hey, why do you think the car companies are doing so terrible? I mean, don't say supply chain, but, you know, they're just doing terrible. Yeah, I I mean, you know, I actually had a, a conversation with a gentleman yesterday about the car companies and never know what's going to happen in the short term. I, I mean, they, they did really well last year. I think it, it was kind of compounded by, what I'm going to say, profit taking yeah. because people were saying, oh, you know, I did really well in 2021. So that kind of started. And then, you know, talked about the supply chain already. Uh, I think maybe two energy costs are going up. Inflation, you talk about all the car companies now raising the price of cars. I mean, you, you saw Tesla uh, announce increases. You've seen Rivian in, uh, announce increases. I think there's just a, a huge culmination of factors that is, you know, kind of creating this perfect storm of short-term trading to get out of these car companies. Yeah, and I think they kind of look at the old car companies the way it used to be that, because we're talking about the recession and so forth. Oh, car companies are terrible during recessions. These are the new car companies. They, they and, and Mary Barr, the CEO of uh, General Motors, talks about how well they can do during downturns. Uh, I believe Ford's the same situation. These are not the car companies where they're going to lose tons of money during a slowdown in the economy. They're much more efficient. But I think still there's that stigma that, oh, it's a car company. We better get out before there, a slow recession comes. So I, I think that could be part of it. But I think it's some good buying opportunities in car companies now 
the right ones, obviously, uh, to be into. Yeah, I think I'm going to let people trade it, and I, I think yeah. you, you look again three, five years down the road with uh, a couple of these car companies. I think you're going to be pretty happy with it because the, the valuations are, are just they're phenomenal on them. Right, and someday GM may bring back that dividend. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> 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 well, it would have been nice to catch them lower, I guess. But um, hey, um, my theory on my own uh, annuity, um, I, I think I know the answer, but I was thinking like, you know, because my thing was buy this stuff real low, create an annuity, you know, to give you dividends and uh, you don't have to worry about it. You know, you have to, you know, check up on it a whole lot. You could save companies or cash them out when they're higher and just keep on, you know, buying stuff cheaper like what you guys do. Right. Right. Yeah. And I don't like the word annuity. <laughs> because there's a lot more fees that go well, into the annuity. I know what you're saying there, but it's funny because a lot of people don't realize annuities actually do invest. Right. You just don't see the volatility. I know what you're saying there, though, Joe. You're creating your own annuity by buying good business. Yeah, you, you're not paying yeah, the high myself. fees. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you're not paying the high fees and the high commissions that the normal annuity people would be paying. So we, we get what you're coming from. But yeah, I mean, you and, and that's the whole thing. That's what our discipline is. Is you want to buy good companies at good prices. Uh, you hold them, you collect good dividends. However, if that company does become overpriced, well, you sell it, and even though you might be getting a good dividend, I mean, we have some of our companies in our portfolio now, they're probably paying uh, seven, eight, twelve percent dividends because of what we pay for them years ago. But if that company was overpriced, we would sell that and find another good business to buy. So you, you want to be yeah, careful but about you never get it. You right. never get it at that price, probably again, you know, that, that really low price when, you know, the market really went down with when you got it and stuff. Yeah, that, 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 that's true. and But that's why you kind of sell it. And then there's some other company. Uh, we did our YouTube uh, video yesterday. Uh, I was sh shocked at 3M, where 3M is trading at. What a great business trading at, uh, what, 30%, 40% below the high a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, I, I think over yeah. 40% compared. I mean, they're, they're I think, five-year returns, like a negative 9% right now. So, uh, again, you could have bought 3M back in, again, 2017 for the nice dividend. And you'd actually had an annual return probably somewhere around 2 3% because right. of the loss on the the stock price but still get a nice dividend. So that's where it always comes back to kind of understanding when to sell things and get in it cuz the dividends are always nice, but if you now look at the cash flow on a new company, well what's the the cash flow yield on that dividend compared to your initial investment on your previous company that you invested in. So it's always dynamic, it's always changing. You got to be careful just kind of buying and holding forever because times do change. Yeah, I figured your your way you victory with was better than what I was thinking, but uh, it just you know it just gosh you know I hate that sell stuff when you got them so good and you know <laughs> the dividend, got them so good price you know. But Joe, that sounds like an but, emotion. That's not good to have emotions in investing. Yeah, <laughs> feel. Well, yeah, emotion, emotion. Yeah, and I I try to get rid of that emotion by selling. Oh, when you know, but, you know, where you guys thought it was price and stuff, and I sold it over that price, and frick, it's never really come down. It's come down and touched that price, but it's always stayed up. Yeah. It always pays that great dividend. I wish I would never sold it. But anyways, let's get on to BBY. Yes. Yeah. Do you hold that? Uh, looking to buy that? No, oh, no. I hold it. Another one. I got a good price. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. And, and this company has done quite a few good things over the years. So let, let's take a look at uh, Bed Bath and Beyond. Or, Best yeah, Buy. Best Buy. Why don't I say Bed Bath and Beyond? Best uh, Buy. Sticker symbol is very similar. <laughs> very similar. That's what it is. Yeah, BBBY think, and BBB. That's exactly right. BBY. Yeah. <laughs> so let me get this straight for the listeners. Talking about Best Buy Company, symbol is BBY. Uh, we do see that they're in the specialty retail industry. Uh, not much float on it, about 5%. Uh, institutional ownership, 81%. Uh, we do see that their PE ratio looking very good. It's uh, 10.4. That's half the industry at 23.2. Price of sales looks good, 0.5 versus 1. Price of tangible book value, 15. The industry is not material. And price of cash flow, 7.8 versus 12.4. Peg ratio, which is your price earnings divided by growth, the lower the number, the better. 1.6. Industries at 1.5. I still like that number. I think it's a pretty good number. Now, their earnings over the last year were up 51%, which is very good, but the industry up 88%. Uh, the sales up 10.7, not quite as good as the industry growth of the last year at 28.2%. <clears throat> we do see a five year earnings per share growth estimate here from the analysts of 7.9% for Best Buy, not as good as the industry at 11.2%. Now you get this nice dividend you're talking about, it's a 3.5%, and what I like seeing is that they only use 25% of the earnings to pay that out. 
The five-year growth rate, very good, 20.1%. So this seems to be that this company likes to continue to grow their dividend. Always tell people, check the cash flow, make sure they can keep doing that. I do see they have grown that dividend for 10 years plus uh, in a row. Look at the balance sheet, uh, current ratio 1.1. That's okay, the industry's at 2.3. Debt to equity 0.9 versus one, I'm okay with that. Uh, net profit margin 5.1, that's better than the industry at 4.5. And then return equity, wow, 61.8 versus 40.1. That sounds too high. Could be a low equity or something, but check that number why it's so high. Yeah, and I, I do wonder, I mean, I was looking at their their stock buyback yield. It's 8%. So this company is a very, very generous to it, its stockholders. Yes. And, you know, uh, I'd be curious as well as what percentage of their earnings growth is coming from buybacks versus what's coming from actual business growth. I mean, because the numbers look here, I'm going to say phenomenal. And the thing, too, you got to realize about stock buybacks is it reduces the equity generally because you're taking cash and displacing it from the balance sheet to buy back stock. So I, I, I would assume the equity is quite low. But with that said, let's look at the, the current price here for Best Buy seats, $101.84. It has fallen from the 52-week high of $141.97 and the low, $85.58. I see year-to-date uh, up about 0.2%, but uh, pretty amazed here. 10-year return for Best Buy, 437.8%. Wow. I mean, this has been a, a huge, huge winner. And I, I remember when, when people were calling for the end of Best Buy because Amazon was going to the take Internet. them over. They were doing, uh, what were they called? Like, what did they call it? Window shopping? I forget the exact terminology, oh, they, yeah, but they'd, they'd go, go in and then buy on Amazon. Buy on Amazon, yep. But uh, this company's done a great job fighting off Amazon and, and really building its business to continue to prosper. Let's look forward, though. I go out to January now, 2024. I see estimated earnings per share of $10.49. That gives us target sell price $174.13. So, I mean, I'd say there's a, a lot of positives here, Joe. I I, I like Best Buy. Yeah. And I, I like it as well. I'm not a tech guy, but I know when I go in there, I feel good. I feel comfortable. I can talk to people. I can get stuff done. Uh, and the stock has always been pretty good stock, and the company's always been a pretty good company. So... Uh, I, I I like it as well. Might even be well. Could even be a buy with some more research on. Yeah, I mean it, the numbers look great. I mean the four P is about ten. Ten. So oh, yeah. it, it's very inexpensive. I do know I actually held Best Buy several years ago in my own personal portfolio. It's one of the first stocks I bought. Um, but I know they were looking at kind of transitioning to more services as well with their Geek Squad. I know that was growing phenomenally back then. I'm curious what percentage of the revenue that now makes up. They also, too, don't just have the technology. They have the refrigerators and the appliances yeah. and stuff for your car. I mean, it, it's a it's a good little hub for people that, like myself, don't know a whole lot about technology. And, and they beat Amazon at their own game, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. So we like it, Joe. So uh, I, I say, yeah, keep holding it. It's a good good business there. Yeah, I plan on keep holding it, even though I get alerts saying, "Oh, it's a great buy," and then all of a sudden, you know, the opposite. You know, right. like, "Oh, now it's a sell." You know, it's like, you know, I don't listen to those guys that much, but um, you know, I think yeah, the customer service they really open that up, and so it kind of gives you that Apple feel, even though they are connected to Apple, yeah. actually. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it, it's a, and again, those guys are the buys and sells. You, you, you're right. Don't pay attention to them. You've got a great business. You, you're following the business. Uh, stay with it and and watch the management. I know they had a, uh, a CEO change. I think it was like five ten years ago. Quite a I while. Think his ago. name was Hubert Jolly. Was the yeah. one that kind of reimplemented the turnaround. And I think in, the new CEO was Karen Barry. I want to say her name yeah. was, and and she she was a pretty darn good CEO from what I remember. Yeah. So yeah, we like it. Stay with it. Yeah. Uh, already. And the buy and sell things are from the brokerage company. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember they don't make <laughs> they don't make money unless you're buying and selling. <laughs> 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 well, it's kind of free for some stuff. Okay. Yeah. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. All right, Joe. Good talking to you. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. bye All right. That does open the phone line, 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. Let's go out to San Diego and speak with Wayne. Wayne, you're in the Smart Vegetable Brent Chase. How can we help you? Morning, gentlemen. Like your opinion on Occidental Petroleum, OXY, they kind of run the stock since the word got out that Warren Buffett's been buying it. Yeah, I've, I've kind of been watching that. That uh, he, he, I don't want to say he kind of spoiled the party, but obviously because of him now it's gone, I think, up tremendously. So let's see if it's still a good time to buy it. Now, do you hold it? You're looking at buying it, Wayne? No, no, no. I'm asking you. I took your advice on Chevron. I called a few weeks ago, and you said 170 hit 174. So I was gone. Oh, good. Thank you. So, so now look for another one. All right, well, let's do that. Uh, let's take a look at uh, Occidental Petroleum. 
uh, symbol is O X Y. I hear people now call it Oxy, is what they're calling it. <laughs> Oxy. Yeah, they, yeah. It's got a name because Warren Buffett bought it, I guess. <laughs> but the, they own the oil and gas uh, ENP. Uh, float is 6.1%. It's not high, but I'm surprised it's even that high. Institutional ownership, 75.8. Uh, a high P.E. ratio, though, 27.3 versus 11.6. Price of sales, 2.1. That's good because the industry is at 2.4. Price of book, book value, 5 versus 5.1. Price of cash flow, 5.2 versus 6. And peg ratio, very good, 0. 0.4 versus 1.3. Now, this is a, a gas oil company. There is no earnings over the past year. Uh, looking at the sales, we do see sales were up 45.7% uh, versus 110% for the industry. And I'll look at the five here as well. 20.8% for Oxy Petroleum versus 17.6. Uh, Five-year growth rate, very good. 23.6. The industry is 13.6. So I guess the EVs won't be coming uh, next month here. Uh, we do say pay <laughs> a, a, a decent dividend here. Oh, no, they don't. I'm sorry. It's a 0.9%. They only use 2.5% to pay that dividend out, uh, the five-year average. And again, these, these oil companies, you kind of really can't look at the history. They were down 29% on the dividend growth. Uh, we could see that turn around at such a small amount. I mean, 2.5%, I said the payout ratio for uh, Oxy to pay that out. The industry has a 28.9%. So we could see that dividend perhaps rise in the, in the future. Look at the balance sheet. Got a current ratio 1.2 versus 1.4. That's Okay. Debt to equity looking a little bit high, 1.5. Uh, the industry is at 0 0.7. So I, I would want to look at that balance sheet to see what's going on with their debt level there. I, I know Warren Buffett's buying it, but again, we've often talked about that. Maybe he's not buying it. Maybe his somebody else is buying it. We're not sure how much he really runs uh, of the Berkshire Hathaway now. Net profit margin uh, is only 9% versus 17.2. And return to equity, 7.4 versus 15.8. So I'm, I'm not really that excited about Oxygen Petroleum right now. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to say the, the Buffett effect has definitely taken place. Yeah. Year-to-date return for <laughs> Occidental up 94.5%. Oh, yeah, that definitely took place. You have a double then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And current price here for it, 56.24, 52-week high, 59.60. 52-week low, that $21.62. And the thing about Buffett buying, too, is I think initially – when it, the news was released, he already had it from his um, SEC filings, mm -hmm. so he's probably done pretty well on it. But I think he also continued to actually buy some additional shares as well, even as the price was going up, from my understanding. And I, I don't know, people were speculating that maybe he's looking at buying the whole company. Maybe. I know Berkshire's got a ton of cash right now, but right. <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, I know Buffett has that ability to buy full companies. But this would be a, a pretty pretty big one for him. But uh, looking forward to Occidental, I want to see the uh, estimated earnings per share out to 2023. I see it's $3.59. It would give us a target sell price of $59.59, .59, so pretty much right at that, that high we covered. And uh, the other thing that I look at that's quite concerning is a year-over-year -year growth for 2022. You're seeing earnings go up 125% to 576 and now again in 2023, about a 38% decline to 359 So Maybe a lot of that's from a mark-to-market adjustment on on the uh, balance sheet for right. the oil on the balance sheet. That that's why they're seeing a huge gain. But anytime I see earnings go from five dollars and seventy-six cents to three dollars and fifty-nine cents, I don't like to see that. that. That's a cause for concern. Yeah, and earlier in the show, I did say too that the futures for December for oil was eighty-eight dollars a barrel below where it is now. So perhaps they are seeing that as well. And one thing too, I mean, that there is another big icon here working on. Actually, Carl Icon <laughs> uh, actually sold his Occidental Petroleum. So. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett does have a different situation. We talk about Berkshire Hathaway. Um, it doesn't really mix into some of the things he has done uh, re in the recent past, but it's just I, I, I would not be buying oil at, at these levels, these companies. I just would not be. I, I think I want to find some other things that are on sale. Oil companies are not on sale now. It's always great when you can buy before Buffett does because then you get the Buffett <laughs> effect. You don't want to buy after the right. Buffett effect because then everybody is like, oh, Warren Buffett bought it. I want to buy it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so Wayne, we, we got to say stay away from Oxy. We, we just don't like it. I, I think that uh, you're part of the excitement if you buy oil companies now, but I think in uh, 6, 12 months, you may be like, oh, gosh, I shouldn't have done that. So, all righty. Can I ask you, are you holding any oil stocks in your portfolio at this time? We have one energy company in our portfolio. 
the refiner, so not a true oil exploration. Oh, you're giving away too much detail, yeah, Chase. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. I, th- I think I know who that is. <laughs> and I think I own it, so yeah. okay, gentlemen. <laughs> oh, appreciate your help. Have a good day. Okay, you too, Wayne. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, that does open the phone line, 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. 0973. And I do want to mention again about that workshop coming up uh, Thursday, April 7th from 6 to 8 in Scripps Ranch. This is what we talk about, what you hear on the show, how to invest in companies. We talk about the details. We show you all the things you shouldn't be doing when it comes to investing. And also, too, we do talk a little bit about financial planning to help you as well. So if you want to sign up for that free workshop, go to our website, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. Uh, you can also call the office 858 858- Five four six four three zero six. That's eight five eight five four six four three zero six. Talk to uh, Priscilla; she gets just signed up, and we'll look forward to seeing you at the workshop on Thursday, April seventh, from six to eight. And we'll, we'll talk about our individualized, concentrated value portfolio, which I actually came up with probably about twenty years ago, over twenty years ago, and why it works well. Yep. So, all right, phone number is eight three three two eight eight zero nine seven three. Let's go out to Coronado and speak with John. John, you're on the Smart Vet Show, Brent Chase. How can we help you? Yeah, hi. Good morning, guys. The stock I was just uh, wondering about was Apple. Do you hold that, John, or looking to buy that? I hold it. Um, you know, the stock's kind of kind of gone up to 180, back down to 150. Now it's back up to around 160. Some of the charts see it retracing all the way back down into the 130s, and Kind of, kind of wondering what you guys think about it. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of glad to look at it. I've not looked at Apple, and gosh, I think it's been months, so I'm kind of curious where it stands now. Uh, their symbol is AAPL. They're in the consumer electronics industry. Uh, not much float at all on it, 0.7%, but only 59% institutional ownership, which does kind of surprise me. I, I know Berkshire Hathaway owns a big portion of this, so that's why you got something on that? I was just going to say, too, it, it, it concerns me. Uh, having that many retail investors. Reason for it is we have another company that uh, has a large retail base. And it's great when things are going up, but retail investors are a lot more fickle Fickle. than your institutional investors. So all of a sudden, Apple falls out of favor. Institutions, oh, Apple's fine, but the real, oh my gosh, you know, this is crazy. They're doing this and it's over. And (laughs) it can cause a lot more volatility, I think, if Apple falls a little bit out of favor. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, we do see that they got a P-E ratio that is uh, on the high side, 27.2 above the industry at 25.1. Price to sales are high, 7.3 versus 4.5. Price to book value, 37.2. That sounds high, but the industry is over 100. Then price of cash flow for Apple is 24.5 versus 22.1. And they do have a nice pay uh, ratio going forward of 1.9 versus 18.7. Now, over the last year, their earnings did climb by 62.5% above the industry at 59.1. And I have a feeling they account for a lot of the industry is my, my feeling. <laughs> uh, we also do see sales are up 28.6%, not quite as good as the industry growth at 33.8. Their five-year growth rate, 14.9, just, uh, just ahead of the industry at 13.6. They do pay a dividend, and they've not increased this dividend in, I believe, quite a while. If they have, it's not been much because the yield now is only 0.5%. They only use 14% of the earnings to pay that out. So they've not really been generous on uh, uh, the shareholders on that dividend, I I don't believe. They have paid a dividend for nine years in a row. Uh, We do see on the balance sheet, current ratio is one, about the same as the industry at 1.1. Debt to equity, now this surprises me, it's a 1.7 versus 1.6, and so I, I, I know for a while they had very low debt, they did borrow money to, as opposed to patronizing uh, money coming back into the states, but that seems pretty high debt of 1.7. I'd wanna look at their balance sheet to see if it's changing or they're adding more debt for some reason. Uh, net profit margin, 26.6, that is better than industry at 17.9. Return on equity, 139. About the same as the industry at 133. Those are just crazy numbers, so they probably have a very low equity base is probably what they have. Chase, what do you got going forward for the company? I was just going to say real quick, I I mean, Apple amazes me Mm -hmm. in in terms of how strong the business has been. And what I mean by that is if you look at the book to tangible book value, they've done this all pretty much organically. I know they've had a few acquisitions, but they don't have, like, any goodwill on their balance sheet. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing 
the business they've built. I, I, I just kind of want to acknowledge that. Yeah, it, it's, it's a great business question is what we're paying for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do know they, they bought back a lot of stock over the years, which, again, has reduced that equity. So I, it's something I'd have to look a little bit closer on the, on the balance sheet. But to, I know they, they've had a lot of earnings growth not come from sales growth, but rather buying back stock and increasing earnings via that metric rather than, again, true growth is what I would call it. Yeah. But uh, looking at the current price for Apple, it's $163.98, 52-week high, $182.94, and the low is $118.86. I see year-to-date down about 7.5%, but gosh, I, I look at the five-year and the 10-year returns here. It, it's phenomenal how, how well the stock has done. Five years, up 396%, 10 years, up 816%. Now, you talked about that small dividend. I believe that's why the dividend looks so small, because they've increased it at about 9% per year over the last five years. But I think the stock price growth has just way outperformed that, which has reduced the size yeah. of the yield. Looking forward to uh, September 2023, though, I do see estimated earnings per share is $6.55. That would give us a target sell price of $108.73. So again, well below the current price. Apple, great company. It's just it's expensive. And, and gosh, for years, it didn't trade. Oh, Apple, it's not worth 16 times earnings. Now, all of a sudden, it trades at over 25 times future earnings. So uh, I, I'd say be careful with it, John. It's had a great 10-year run, and I'm 90% sure it's not going to have the same 10-year run over the right. next decade that it has seen over the past decade. Yeah, and, it, and it's expensive, and you can't can't deny that. And our philosophy does not want to hold expensive companies. And again, Apple's a great company, done great things. But we have seen this over time where things go up, and one or two things are going to happen. Either Apple is going to come way down, which did happen. I remember back, gosh, about five, ten years ago, it came way down. Uh, either that's going to happen, or you're not going to see much growth on it for the next five to ten years. It's around, what, what would you say, 160, around 163? Yeah. I mean, it's possible in uh, five, ten years, it'll be around 200. You know, you won't make that much money on it because it's it's done so much so quickly that it can't stay on that path. So I, I, I do recommend to sell an Apple. Yeah. Great business, but just too expensive. And I think there's other things that will do better over the next five to 10 years than what Apple will do. Okay, John? Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Have a good one. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. All righty, that does open the phone line, 833-288-0973. Again, that's 833-288-0973. But before we go back to the calls, it's time to talk to our financial planner, Harrison Johnson. Good morning, Harrison. How are you doing this morning? Good morning, guys. I'm doing well. How are you doing? Well, good, good. you got a very important topic I think a lot of people want to talk about, and that's early retirement. I think a lot of people say, oh, I want to retire early. How can I do it? So this is something that I've been seeing quite a bit. Um, you know, someone will come in and say, well, I was thinking about waiting until 70 or 67 or 62 or 65 or whatever it is, but now just because of the way things are going in their work life or their home life or their health or you know, whatever, they're thinking about retiring early and they want to see if that's possible. So <clears throat> when we think about retirement, all it is is it's transitioning from earned income through wages or self-employment to now you're shifting to many income sources, um, which could be IRA income, Roth income, non-retirement account income, rental income, Social Security pensions, um, all kinds, types of different stuff. So the thing to understand here is when you're working either through wages or self-employment, that income is taxed at a higher rate than all of your retirement income is going to be. And in addition to that, all of that retirement income is taxed differently than itself too. IRAs are different than TODs are different than rental, different than social security. That's all different, but all of them are better tax wise than earned income is. So, when I am working with somebody and we're trying to get them to retire early, in almost every case we can find a way to have their income potential, what I call is uh, basically the amount of monthly after-tax spending they can generate, um, or the after-tax income they can generate per month, the maximum amount. Usually that number that we can create is much higher than what people are expecting. And that's not saying, okay, great, we're just going to put this all into an annuity or we're just going to um, put it all investing something. It's more about how we structure those different sources and how much we can reasonably withdraw from them while also making sure we're doing so in a tax effective way. So I spoke with somebody earlier this week where 
They still have all the same assets, but we're restructuring everything a little bit. And so the result of that is she's going to have about extra $1,000 a month in income, and we're going to reduce our taxes by about $2,000 a year. So more income, less taxes. I talked to somebody else um, last week, and right now they're working and thinking about retiring. And, you know, they have the mentality, well, I got to keep working, got to keep working. Right now, their take home pays about $7,000 from working, where if we look at if they were to retire right now, based on all their income sources, their take home pay from those sources would be about $11,000 a month. So quite a bit higher. And they were shocked to hear that. And a lot of people are shocked to to see how big those numbers are. Um, I had somebody else where we can generate up to $50,000 a month in after tax income. So it's all over the board, but in pretty much every situation that I look at, if we can structure those income sources the right way, we can, again, lead to a lot more income than, than people are expecting and have a much lower tax liability that, that people are used to. And, and Harrison, I think it's probably a very frightening thing. I'm sure you see this with people because you, you're right to go from a, like a, I got to keep working, I got to keep working to you don't have to work any longer and you'll make more money. It's just frightening because you've changed after maybe 40 I mean, 45 years <laughs> now, no, you don't have to work any longer and you get paid for it. It, it must be kind of frightening for some people. It is, and it's, it, it, it's not what people are expecting. You know, people are, it's ingrained into them where in order to make money, you have to work. You have to exchange your time and your labor in order to create money for yourself. And that's how you live. Because, yeah, if you've done that for 45 years, that's the way you think. And so it is. It is a little bit different to say, okay, well, now you don't have to work at all, and you can have more income and pay less taxes on that income. That is a foreign concept that it does take some time to adjust to, but it's a pretty good adjustment to go into. Again, how that sounds like a pretty good deal, more income, less taxes, don't have to work for it. Um, but what that is, it's really a result of people working their whole lives and then making the right decision. Now they set themselves up to generate those retirement income streams. So they maybe not have not understood what they've been doing throughout their lives, but um, as far as saving money and the, the benefit that that would result in, but um, it, as long as we do the right things, then we can generate that income that, again, it's a lot more than what people think it will be. Yeah, exactly. And well, it's nice to have that option too, because we, we've seen people are like, oh, I'd like to retire. Oh no, you can't retire. <laughs> right, you know? I know. It's nice to have that option of yeah. saying you can keep working, or, you know, go do something else that you like. Maybe pick up some additional income, uh, you know, I'll say because I coach football. Is maybe go coach football and pick yeah. up a little stipend there, and then you can retire and do what you want. And, and Harrison, the other important thing that you do, too, is a cash flow analysis. Because somebody say, yeah, I can retire. But then you do your analysis. It's like, well, yeah, but you're going to run out of money in 25 years. What if you live 26 years? You're in trouble. So this is the other thing you got to look at, too, is not just can you retire now, but can you sustain retirement for 20, 30 years, maybe longer? Yeah, exactly. And how much, what does retirement actually look like? You know, $3,000 a month of retirement income versus $30,000 a month of retirement income is a lot different. Yeah. Um, so based on your lifestyle, how long can you live based on that? And what I like to do, I never, I never want anybody to run out of money regardless of how long they live. So when we're setting up income streams, some people ask, well, how long does this last? Well, the way that we're doing it, it lasts basically forever. You can live to be 200 and it's still producing the income because the income sources there are just, you're basically living off of the growth, dividends, interest, that type of thing. So it's it's never, we never have the goal of depleting assets or, or having somebody run out of money at some point. Exactly. Well, Harrison, thanks uh, for calling this morning. Uh, we'll see you on Monday morning and uh, you have a great weekend. All right, guys. We'll see you. Later. Okay. Bye bye. Again, as uh, Harrison Johnson, our CFP at Wills Asset Management, we'd like a free consultation. We'll sit down and talk about your situation for financial planning. And again, he is a true financial planner. He does not sell you any product. He's on a salary, no bonuses, just to do what's best for you. Give him a call at the office, 858 546 4306. That's 858 546 4306. You can also go to the website, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com and sign up for that free consultation with them there as well. All right, phone number's here, 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. Let's go up to, uh, I guess, Elfin Forest and speak with Joseph. Joseph, you're on the Smart Invest Show. Brent Chase, how can we help you? Good morning. So I hold a lot of uh, PacWest. 
to bank stock. Okay. I was wondering what you would uh, think about that stock. And when you say you hold a lot of it, uh, percentage-wise, how much of your portfolio is a lot? It's probably 20%, 20, 25%. Okay, yeah, that, that's pretty heavy. Usually when we get to like 15 17%, we start pairing it back because if you hold too much in all one company and something happens to Pack West Bank, uh, your your portfolio will be hurt pretty bad. So let's take a look at uh, Pack. Yeah, I, I bought it when it was like, Capital Bank a long time ago, and then it went to First Community, and now it's PacWest. So. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully it's still good, but let's take a look at the PacWest Bank. That's B A N C. Uh, symbol is P A C W. They're in the regional bank uh, industry. Uh, not much float out, 3.4, but 91% institutional owned. Uh, PE ratio looking pretty good here. It's uh, 8.8 versus 10.6. We do see price of sales, 4.2. That is double the industry at 2.4. Price to book value does look good, though, 2.1 versus 3.4. And then price of cash was expensive, 10.4 versus 4.3. And they do have a nice peg ratio, 1 versus 6.9. So the valuation ratio is looking pretty good here so far. We do see on the growth side, we see uh, nothing on the earnings per share growth for the one year. So I don't know if they had some write-offs or something happened. I mean, some banks or should have had some, some earnings. So I'd want to find out, did they have earnings? Did they write something off? What happened over the last year? Uh, we do see the industry grew at 70.8% on the earnings. Over the five-year, uh, PacWest did grow their earnings at 11.9%, uh, a little bit under the industry at 136 Sales, uh, one year up 11.6, better than the industry up 5.7. They do have a five-year estimated growth rate of 10%, about double the industry up five, so that's good. They pay a decent dividend of 2.2%, use about uh, 20% of their earnings to pay that out. Uh, we do see that they've not grown that dividend in the last five years. Actually, it's been negative. So something maybe went on with this company where they reduced it or something. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm seeing I got a lot, a lot of research to do to tell you to hold on to this company. Uh, we do see that uh, against a bank, so they don't have a normal balance sheet, but their debt to equity is only 0.2 versus 1. So that's a positive. Uh, we do see the net profit margin, 48.2 versus 22.9. So that seems a little bit too high. Uh, again, I'm kind of feeling this company may have done some write-offs uh, at one point in time here is what I'm thinking. Uh, we do see that um, return equity, 14.9 versus 10.1. So I've got some things I like, some things I don't. I'm kind of curious what you got over there, Chase. Yeah, it's an interesting bank, and I was kind of surprised. I've never heard of PacWest, and we live here in San Diego. But uh, looking at, I guess, their operations, they, they have 69 full-service branches that are located in California. Uh, this is strange. One branch located in Durham, North Carolina. Wow. That's, <laughs> I'd understand maybe one branch in Arizona or something. Yeah. <laughs> North maybe Carolina maybe the CEO was there or something. I don't know. And then one branch located in Denver, Colorado. So it's strange that they have those two locations on top of the 69 here. It's strange. But they also do have various loan production offices. They are headquartered in Beverly Hills, California, so I, I, maybe they're targeting kind of a higher-end customer because to have 69 branches just in California, they have a market cap of about $5 billion. That, that's pretty good size, in my good opinion, size. for that yeah. amount of branches. So it, it's it's interesting. I'd want to know more details about their operations, You know, who is their target audience for their clientele, you know, what are their profit margins on the different uh, business lines, things like that, because it, it, it's it's a regional bank, but a hyper-focused regional bank really in California. I'd, I'd be willing to venture that 98% of their revenue comes from here in California. With that said, let's look I at the- I think they're, they're, they, have a, they have a history of like rolling it up and selling. Their management has run banks in the past. Uh -huh. They, you know, ended up selling and it, you know, when they sell, they, they traded it like two and a half times put value. So yeah. hopefully they'll, they'll sell this thing and yeah, maybe sell to like a U.S. Game. bank or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Some, somebody big. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. get scooped up. But uh, yeah, because if I look at the, the the current levels here, I mean the the numbers look look pretty good, and I'll tell you why. The current price forty four dollars eighty five cents. Fifty two week high fifty one eighty one. 52-week low, 35.71. Year-to-date, uh, it's about flat. But the reason I say it looks good, I go out to December 2023, I see estimated earnings per share of $5. Would give us a target sell price around 83 with forward PE of just 9. And, and uh, just very surprised, 10 analysts on this company. It's yeah. not like it, it's just a, you know two or three. I mean, uh, that's pretty amazing to me. The numbers look good. 
I will say I am cautious. Generally, I don't like to have too much concentration in one area. It is a little concerning that it's all in California. It can go super great, but if California slows down, could be very, very problematic. Yeah, and again, as I pointed out too, I don't know why they had no earnings over the past year. You've got to find out what's going on there. Uh, I did notice on the analysts that those numbers were also pretty tight of those 10 analysts. So, so I like this company. I think it's pretty good. I, I, I would, and we have a discipline in our firm, and you might want to adopt it as well. No matter how good it is, we, we do pair it back at from 20%. I'd probably go back down to 15 because if something does happen to this company, who knows what could happen, but things do happen, and all of a sudden you could lose a big portion so our discipline is, yeah, we, we'd probably pull it back at this point, probably down to 15%. But it's a great, great business with the exception of the earnings. I just know what's going on with the earnings there. All right, Joe? Yeah, I'll take that out. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a, a great day. day. Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. All right. That does open the phone line, 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. Let's go out to San Diego and speak with Jairus. Jairus, you're on the Smart Vegetable, Brent Chase. How can we help you? Hey, guys. Uh, it's Ruben. I'm actually, I'm sorry, Jairus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, calling, uh, I'm calling from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and it's freezing out here. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> just just want to say hello to you guys, and thank you for the terrific workshop a couple of weeks ago. Man, you guys are, are, are terrific, and I really appreciate it. And uh, for all you listeners that haven't uh, gotten to a workshop, uh, one coming up, coming up uh, I think, uh, Brett, you said April 20th, is that right? Uh, no, April 7th, Thursday, April 7th, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, sorry about that, April okay. 7th, don't listen to me. Uh, <laughs> no, listen to you because you're saying but, good uh, things, you know. <laughs> all right, yeah, all right, so uh, don't have a company right now because uh, just having breakfast here at a terrific place, but just wanted to call and say hello and appreciate uh, what you guys do. And uh, I set up a little meeting with Chase, and hopefully, Brett, you can join us oh, and, definitely. or uh, help us out, and uh, look forward to meeting with you guys. Well, I got an important question for you. Where are you having breakfast right now? Oh, it's a place called Las, Los, Las Posadas, and oh. uh, wow, they just uh, brought my food. I put a napkin over it to give you guys a quick shout, <laughs> but uh, I got to go eat, guys. <laughs> well, we'll let you go, but now I'm kind of hungry, but enjoy your breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent food, and the people are so nice out here. Uh, just terrific. Uh, northern New Mexico, they're the best. We got some snow a couple of days ago, and uh, here we go. Well, Take care, guys. Hey, enjoy your breakfast. All right, Jarvis. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of hungry for breakfast now. Now you brought up breakfast because I, I, I haven't eaten yet. It's like, oh, yeah, no, I'm kind of hungry there. But uh, he did bring up the workshop. And, and again, he actually, and we did not pay him for that endorsement. <laughs> no. he, you He's know, just a nice guy. Just a nice guy. And uh, he did enjoy the workshop. And there are a lot of things we go over on that workshop. And, you know, we do talk more about the individualized concentrated value portfolio. We talk about finding the quality businesses at good prices. And, and also, too, how to invest in strong e and, uh, equities. Like give me that best long-term return. We're not traders. We're not going to show you how to trade stock or how to buy cryptocurrencies. We're going to show you how to invest on a good fundamental basis that you can live with. And, and, and actually today we do have our client event. Uh, we have, I, I know, what, well over 200 clients, I think, showing up. Mm -hmm. uh, many of those clients have been with me. I talked to a client yesterday who's been with me for, gosh, I think 35 years. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, again, it, it works long-term. But if you're looking for somebody that's going to have all the hype and the excitement, you're not going to get at the workshop. You're going to get a good foundational investment way to invest uh, that works out very well. It is free. What you have to do is go to the website to sign up, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. You can call the office at 858-546-4306. That's 858-546-4306. Just ask for Priscilla. We'll get you signed up. And look forward to seeing you on Thursday, April 7th at uh, 6 p.m. Yeah, no, we're looking forward to it. And, and I think it is so important we're doing the workshop now. And, and I was talking to a gentleman yesterday and, and just kind of talking about the investing environment. And the hardest part is your emotions tell you there's never a good time to invest. Right. And what I mean by that is last year people were saying, oh, my gosh, the stock market's so expensive. I just want to wait until things pull back. Well, now you have the pullback. And now you have Russia, Ukraine. Oh, my gosh. Well, now we're in the middle of a war. I just don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. It's going to go back up, and then it's going to be too expensive again. Or we're going to have another you know, concern that arises. There's never a perfect environment emotionally for you right. to invest. And that's why you can't time it. You never can time the market. That's why this investment approach, it works so well. Is we, we 
say no emotions, just results. It's our slogan. It's about buying businesses. I don't care about what's going on in the world. And <laughs> actually, that sounds too cold. I do care about what's going on in right. the world, but it doesn't impact my investment decisions because the businesses are figuring out ways to still run their business and still grow and improve over time. And, and again, it's so important to kind of understand the companies and so forth we're investing in. Uh, I, I, we did a post this past week on uh, the movie chain, uh, AMC. And after losing a record $41.3 million in 2021, uh, decided to spend $27.9 million to invest in Highcroft Mining Holding. Now, uh, I'm sure your initial reaction, like mine, was why would a movie chain company want to hold an investment in a gold miner? And, and I'll tell you why they said. I said oh, they it said was that. for diversification reasons. <laughs> and the thought is, are, are they trying to act as an investment firm? I mean, I would rather see them focus on the entertainment industry. If they do make a profit off this, it'll be confusing for shareholders as to why the company is making profits. Uh, I'll just sum it up and say this was a foolish move and, and stay away from the stock. And I don't know if they think they're Warren Buffett and trying to create essentially a holding investment yeah. company. That's, I, I think it's ludicrous. I mean, they're they need to focus on that that business because it, it's a tough business right now. Oh, very tough business. And I, I think there can be potential for the movie chain business going forward yeah. if they do the right things. And were they the ones that actually said they would let people buy popcorn with crypto? Yeah. I, I, I don't understand that because crypto is, what, $40,000 and I'm going to go buy a bag, <laughs> bag of popcorn. I don't get that. But, uh, but besides that, I mean, you've got to come up with ways to get people back in the movie theater. And, and, and we love going to the, the movie theater, um, oh, the lot. Yeah. Um, it's an experience is what it is. And, and that's what they have to do. And they don't have to follow what the lot does, but make it so that people, and people want to go out. They don't want to be in the home all day playing video games, watching movies in the, on the TV. <clears throat> they want that <clears throat> experience to go out and, and enjoy life. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just, I don't know. I, I think it, it's very interesting to take this approach. And, and the meme stocks, they're, they're, they're still way overpriced. I oh, mean, yeah. you look yeah. at like GameStop and AMC and, and GameStop reported a terrible quarter, a terrible quarter. Yeah. They had a loss on earnings per share and they were expecting a gain. Most stocks had plummet. No, no. AMC, uh, GameStop goes up a few percent it, it, and it was down huge in pre-market, but then the, the retail investors came in, I guess, and started buying it and, and it's nowhere near the frenzy that we saw last year, but just just be careful with those stocks because they still have no true fundamental value, uh, at least compared to where they're trading at this point. Yeah, and I want to bring out that the reason I brought the AMC theater is that when you're investing in a company or in a business, you don't want them doing other things. Um, and especially because right now we're talking about it, but you buy that stock six months from now, unless you do a deep dive in the research, you're not going to know that they own what was it, 20 some million dollars, whatever it was, in a, a gold mining company. You're not going to know that unless you dig deep into it. And it really throws off the investors. Yeah, it really, th and I think they own now like 21% in the gold miner. And, and the thing is now, what if that gold miner goes bankrupt yeah. and, you know, or the price of gold doesn't do well? Now that's a huge loss to the investors. It, it was kind of like the CEO, whoever made the decision, uh, is trying to play the price of gold. Like, oh, gold's going to go up, so let's buy this gold mining company. Why would you do that when you're in a movie? theater chain business. It makes no sense to me at all. It's really, I think, unfair to investors. I almost think that the CEO is trying to play more on the stock price than actually yeah. run the business. They're, they're doing crazy things that are, are trying to appeal to investors, but uh, it, it's, or make headlines. Yeah. And even though they pretty much sold all their stock, the, <laughs> remember that? I mean, right. it's, I don't know. I, I, I just, I wouldn't go near those companies. Yeah. They, they made headlines, but there's good headlines and bad headlines, and that, in my opinion is not a good headline, that's a bad one. And I would definitely stay, stay away from the stock. It's a, it's a gambling chip is what that stock really has become. Yeah, I, that's all it is. I mean, if you look at the number, it's not even worthwhile to look at the fundamentals on those companies. No, it's no okay. Alrighty, well, wow, there's a closing bell already. Thank you for listening to the Smart Investing Show. It is for informational purposes only and should not be used as investment advice. If you'd like to discuss in more detail your investment needs, have other investment questions, feel free to call myself Brent Wilsey or Chase Wilsey at 858-546-4306. That's 858-546-4306. Or visit our website, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. And for more daily educational information on investment tips, go to our Facebook page, Smart Investing with Brent and Chase Wilsey. Thanks for listening to the show. Have a great day. 
We're back here next week right here on the Smart Investing Show. To think that I did all that And may I say Not in a sh-